The hip joint is a strong and stable ball and socket type of synovial joint, which forms the connection between the lower limb and the pelvic girdle. The head of the femur is the ball and the acetabulum is the socket. Except for the depression or the fovea for the ligament of the femoral head, all of the femoral head is covered with articular cartilage, which is usually thickest over weight-bearing areas. The hip joint is a multi-axial joint, meaning it has a wide range of motion. It can do flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, external rotation, internal rotation, and circumduction. Let's talk about the joint capsule of the hip. The hip joints are enclosed within a strong joint capsule. The capsule is formed by the external fibrous layer, known as the fibrous capsule, which also forms part of the ligaments of the hip, and then the internal synovial membrane, which is a membrane that contains a synovial fluid. Let's focus on the fibrous capsule. Now, proximally, the fibrous layer attaches to the acetabulum. Distally, the fibrous layer attaches to the femoral neck. Only anteriorly at the intertrochanteric line and the root of the greater trochanter, and then posteriorly, the fibrous layer crosses the femoral neck proximal to the intertrochanteric crest, but does not actually attach to it. The thick parts of the fibrous layer help form the ligaments of the hip joint. So the ligaments of the hip joint, briefly, just acts to increase the stability of the hip joint. They can be divided into two groups, intracapsular ligaments and extracapsular ligaments. The intracapsular ligaments well, there's only one, and this is the ligament of the head of the femur, which runs from the acetabular fossa to the fovea of the femur. It actually encloses a branch of the obturator artery, known as the foveal artery, a minor source of arterial supply to the hip joint, and this is mainly during pediatric age. The extracapsular ligaments are more important in adulthood, and the names of the extracapsular ligaments are based on where the ligament attaches to the pelvis. And the pelvis is made up of the, briefly, ileum, ischium, and pubis. So first you have the iliofemoral ligament, which is the strongest of the three ligaments. And then you have the pubofemoral ligament and the ischiofemoral ligament. Again, the extracapsular ligament passes in a spiral fashion from the pelvis to the femur, and this causes them to become tighter. Flexion of the hip joint increasingly unwinds the spiraling ligaments and fibers, and this allows for more mobility of the hip joint in flexion. Let's look at some clinical anatomy. Firstly, the dislocation of the hip joint. Now, dislocation of the hip joint can occur as a congenital dislocation. And here, the hip joint is one of the most common joints affected. It occurs due to two main reasons. Firstly, the joint capsule is loose at birth, or you can have hypoplasia of the acetabulum and femoral head. And here you can see images of testing in a baby for hip dislocation. Then you have acquired hip dislocation. And in acquired dislocation, it is uncommon because as mentioned, the hip joint is usually very stable. 
a posterior dislocation of the hip joint is most common and can occur in car accidents. This is because when driving, your hip is flexed, so the ligaments are relaxed, remember, and the joint is unstable. Head-on collision forces the femur out of the acetabulum, causing a shortened and internally rotated limb. Let's talk about the blood supply. The blood supply to the hip joint is from the medial and lateral femoral circumflex arteries, which form the extracapsular ring and give rise to the cervical arteries. I'll have a video that talks more about neck of femur fractures, which goes into this in detail. Another direct source of blood supply to the femur is from the foveal artery, which only occurs in the pediatric population, because eventually this is replaced by the ligamentum teres. The ligamentum teres is the ligament connecting the head of the femur to the acetabulum. Another blood supply is from the cruciate anastomoses, which is between the inferior gluteal artery and the medial circumflex femoral artery. Some clinical anatomy, avascular necrosis of the femoral head or osteonecrosis of the femoral head is characterized as bone cell death that occurs following an impairment of blood flow to the bone from a traumatic or a non-traumatic origin. As we have learned, the blood supplying the femoral head rely on small arteries with limited collateral blood supply. And so the femoral head is a very easy spot where you can have lack of blood supply, causing necrosis. Another clinical anatomy to know is what's known as Perthes disease. Perthes disease is an idiopathic avascular necrosis of the capital femoral epiphyses. And this is usually affecting children, again, between ages 4 and 12 years old. It more commonly affects male and also children exposed to maternal smoking during pregnancy. Clinically, when you have Perthes disease, this causes destruction and flattening of the head of the femur with an increased joint space on x-ray, as you can see. The hip joint is innervated primarily by the sciatic, femoral, and obturator nerves. These same nerves innervate the knee as well, which explains why pain can be referred to the knee from the hip joint and vice versa. Now let's talk about the muscles that acts on the hip joint. We already learned about the motions of the hip joint. Now let's talk about the muscles. So the main flexors of the hip joint are the iliopsoas muscles, which include the psoas major and iliacus, as well as the rectus femoris muscle. To a lesser extent, you have other flexors, include sartorius and pectineus. The primary extensors of the hip joint is the gluteus maximus muscle, assisted by the hamstring muscles biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus, as well as the adductor magnus muscle. The primary AB ductors of the hip joint are the gluteus medius and gluteus minimus muscles. The major adductors of the hip joint are the adductus longus, adductus brevis, and magnus, as well as the gracilis muscle. Internal rotators of the hip joint include the anterior fibers of the gluteus medius and minimus. External rotators is produced by the gluteus maximus, together with a group of six small muscles, which include the piriformis, obturator internus, superior and inferior gemelli, and quadratus femoris and obturator externus. Now that we've learned about the muscles and what they do at the hip joint, 
we can now understand some of the examination techniques for the hip joint, beginning with the Trendelenburg test. The Trendelenburg sign is a physical examination finding seen when assessing for someone with a dysfunctional hip. Patients are asked to stand on one leg, and the position of the pelvis is noted. So if the pelvis drops, so for example, on the left-hand side here, the pelvis is dropped, the patient may sway to the loaded leg, and the test is positive. Now, a positive Trendelenburg sign will indicate weakness in the hip abductor muscles, of which is the gluteus medius and minimus, on the side that the leg is standing on. Another test is known as Thomson's test. This test helps unmask a fixed flexion deformity of the hip and measure the true range of hip flexion. With the patient supine, fully flex one hip, make sure the lower back is flat. If the contralateral hip lifts off the table, there is a likely fixed flexion deformity of that leg. And it could be due to tightness, for example, of the iliopsoas muscle or the rectus femoris muscle, which are the muscles involved in hip flexion. So in summary, the hip joint is a strong and stable ball and socket type of synovial joint, which forms a connection between the lower limb and the pelvic girdle. The hip joint is a multi-axial joint, meaning it has a wide range of movement, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, external and internal rotation. The hip joints are enclosed within a strong joint capsule, which is formed by the external fibrous layer and the internal synovial membrane. Thank you for watching.